This is the last OGM call of 2023 on Thursday, December 28th. Uh, we are gathered here to reflect on 2023 and maybe shine some light on 2024. Um, this is also the time when lots of columnists and other people write either retrospectives or analyses of what the coming year is going to come. If you've seen a good one of those, please share those in the chat or come up and talk about them. And happy to start anywhere on this or switch topics if 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 you're if you're overcooked on 2023 and don't want to go back over it, for example, <clears throat> we can uh, skip on. <coughs> Anybody? Anybody want to relate your your best experience of the year? What what memorable thing happened to you in twenty twenty three? Was it so unmem unmemorable that none of us will remember the year? It'll just be like elided from memory. It was memorable, but you asked for the best thing. Uh, <laughs> I you know I didn't want us to go doom scrolling in our our history so quickly. And but now that we... <laughs> but now that you've asked, <laughs> I had an interesting experience a week ago. Please, um, I found myself at a dinner party with um, five, four very MAGA people, and one who, what you know, my friend who had just been influenced by the people around her. And so, you know, at first I wasn't going to say anything and they started talking about immigration. So under my breath, I said to my friend, that's not true. And she thought it was really funny to out me. So she did. And for the rest of the night, now I was, now I wasn't going to stop. I wanted to discuss it. The two women and her went outside. They were watching like QVC. I mean, it was totally not where I belonged. And I stayed with the two men and we were talking politics. And we did really, I mean, this went on for a few hours. And I was really proud of myself. You know, like they were listening to me. I was listening to them. We were mm -hmm. finding places of agreement. Matter of fact, the one, the host, when I left, he really thanked me for having this conversation. But the other gentleman got a little drunk. So when he was talking about immigration at one point, I said, well, actually, there have been more arrests at the border since Biden. And he couldn't believe it. So, of course, I pull out my phone and I show it to him. And he's like, no, no, it's not real. Where's it from? I said, um, the Cato Institute. I said, I don't remember what that is, but I'm pretty sure it's not a left wing. Fit. And I looked it up. He, his head got to a point that out of nowhere, he just said, well, it's better than Michelle Obama being a transvestite. At that point, <laughs> at that point, I just said, you just, I said, that's it. I said, you just devolved the conversation. And I went into the other room where people were getting ready to say goodbye. And I said, um, I said, he just ruined it, you know, and I, and they kind of bought into it. And it really took me back. And I just said, you know, that's like really rude and disrespectful. But anyway, I wasn't perfect towards the end because it really triggered me. I wound up, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't be saying this, but I wound up, I wound up pulling up the naked pictures of Melania for, oh, I left out this. I go to sit at the table and they made these really nice cranberry martinis and they were delicious. And I turn around and on the wall was orange Jesus. Oh, nice. nice. But I got through all that. So I was so proud of myself the whole time. But towards the end, I guess with the alcohol and just my resistance was down. I mean, it was, you know, the odds were against me. But I really thought the woman's head was going to explode. It was, it was just weird looking at these two people because I almost felt like I did damage to them because... And they were very lovely people. I have to say they were very lovely and they were great hosts to me and they hugged me and they were wonderful. But the truth was hurt. I mean, it was literally hurting them and I could see it in their face. So that, that was my experience. I went home and I, I was like, well, you didn't do that bad. You wanted to say this, this and this and you didn't. But I still got sucked in a little bit. 
So that was my <laughs> end of year experience. That is awesome. I feel like I've just heard a Three Musketeers adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where you were sort of riding across the town square and suddenly there were soldiers in red who drew their swords <laughs> and they had feathers in their hats and then they like surrounded you and <laughs> you were like dueling it out with them. And it sounds great. I love it. Thank you. Um, that being said, one thing, that, and you're yeah. muted anyway, but that being said, I really felt it was important because I did feel like an ambassador yes. in a lot of yeah. ways. It did It did feel important. Sorry, exactly. Doug. Exactly. And someone had their hand up before Doug, and I was sort of stepping in front of them, but I've forgotten who, who it was. It was me. Anyway, it was you. So let's go, let's go uh, Gil, Doug, Kevin. Just real quickly, uh, Stacey, I'm, I'm enormously impressed. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't. I, whatever you think you didn't do, it sounds like it sounds like a stunning experience. I never thought of making people's heads explode as a political strategy, but <laughs> you've revealed that. Um, you. um, this is part of my reflection on 2023. As 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 um, uh, apologies, Ken Homer. As afraid I am of Trump and what he's up to, I am much more afraid of the people that you had dinner with. Mm. And I and and just to reinforce that we we did our once every I don't know six months ten minutes on Fox News this week and holy crap um, you know the thought that that is the place where most Americans get their quote news mm -hmm. is uh, really disturbing. Modern media strategy is super powerful. Yeah, uh, anyway, that for now. Yeah, thanks, Gil. Doug C. Well, uh, I might be like the drunk guy at the party that Stacey was talking about, but I hope not. It seems to me that in this group, more than any group I'm in, we ought to be able to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. So the one that's on my mind a lot is with increasing temperatures, uh, making life impossible in lots of places. Mm -hmm. And things like that, we're beginning to face the issue of how do we die? Mm -hmm. Uh, starvation is not fun. Heat death is not fun. Uh, is there uh, is a time coming when we're going to make uh, choices about how it happens, or are we going to just let history roll us over? Have you read much uh, Jim Bendel? Uh, some. Or seen his stuff? Because there's a deep adaptation movement, which is trying to address not dying, but <clears throat> adapting deeply. Also, the first time I met Vinay Gupta, I, did, I was supposed to have a 15 minute call with him and it turned into an hour and a half when it was midnight in London on a Sunday on his side. And the, one of the first things he brought up was the, the six ways humans die, which is a trope of his that says you, you, you starve, you extreme temperatures, lack of food, lack of oxygen, old age. I don't remember what it was. I'll find it. I'll find the site. Um, so that might be relevant, but um, and I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to Doug, or if I just go to Kevin, let's let's see how that rolls. Uh, Doug and Kevin, why don't you jump in? Okay. Um, well, I've got a a thing that is my look at the year that will end up close to where Stasis was. Um, and I've been working it on economic justice for a while, and as this group knows, it's not a popular topic. Almost no one ever asks anything more about what I talk about. They just say, "Oh, that's nice." but it's never a topic for continuing conversation. And my mentor in this work <clears throat> is a black woman here named uh, Stephanie Swepps and Twitty said, Kevin, when we built our community equity fund, which solves the problem of friends and family funding for sole proprietors, not startups who uh, don't have friends and family money and never get into CDFI you know, concessionary loans. And by the way, I'm not afraid of Gil's ghostly image. That may be your goal with that image, Gil, but it's it's not as scary as you think. Um, anyway, the uh, she said, look, you're, you're creating a marketplace for all the white folks who care, and there's not enough. So this year I've been working on building partnerships on single issues where affluent white folks have a common cause with us. And uh, we've done it to reverse redlining on justaccounting.org is the first initiative of that. And it brings in strong towns and they're the new urbanists. They call themselves the children of Jane Jacobs. They're the folks who know the folks at zoning and planning and are the folks at zoning and planning who advocate for walkable neighborhoods. And they've discovered that taxation is unfair and they want transparent taxation. Then they discovered it's unfair. <clears throat> and then they discovered that it's unfair historically <clears throat> and unfair to those people in the same neighborhoods 
oh, and look, those people are not like us. And so they, along with the Racial Justice Coalition and the foundation, are trying to get uh, the, the heart of it that you can address of redlining is that poor neighborhoods are subsidizing rich neighborhoods with their property taxes. They're taxed at fair value and rich neighborhoods are not taxed at fair value. And if they can make taxation transparent, there'll be more money for walkable neighborhoods. In um, San Antonio, where we're going, we're doing the same thing with foundations behind it, but also affluent white folks who own big businesses. And now we've got the Realtors Board on board. And there's a pretty amazing book that is uh, Freedom to Discriminate that talks about the, I, the separation and division in the U.S. actually started with a guy, you can point to lots of starts, but this, this realtor in Fresno who had the Realtors Board that became a national program uh, right after Martin Luther King's uh, 63 speech, you know, I have a dream, et cetera. And, you know, they, he, they redefined uh, freedom as free, the freedom of the individual. And then if you, you get freedom, I lose freedom as opposed to freedom for all. And that became a national thing that realtors use to redline and only uh, uh, serve white neighborhoods and uh, consciously discriminate against black and Hispanic neighborhoods. And, um, and they, it's a continuing thing. And uh, it was uh, when it became illegal with some fair housing stuff, it was adopted by Ronald Reagan and then uh, Nixon and uh, the um, freedom to discriminate. And it's the story of, of the, how the realtors created the. They had to redefine freedom. And that's what the Heritage Foundation really loves about what they did is that they redefined freedom as freedom of the individual and it was freedom from rather than freedom for all. And so the freedom of the individual meant that any freedom you, t you had was taking it away from me. And so um, it, it then becomes, you know, that's where fear of immigration comes. They're gonna come in and take our stuff. So it's an interesting thing. So anyway, what I found in my economic justice work is that, you know, it isn't a popular thing. Again, no one on this call ever asked more about what I, what I talk about, but I'm finding single issue things that affluent people are about, like the folks who want walkable neighborhoods, who are strong towns, who are, who are urbanists, and now the realtors in one place. So anyway, you have to find your, your allies who don't care about what you care about. This group cares about climate. They don't really care about economic justice. And so that's okay. It, you know, yeah, you can say that, Jerry, but it's just all, it is totally true. It is, I, I never get a follow-up question of anything I talk about. So, you know, you can look at your actions and look at the recording to see that I'm, I'm actually accurate in saying that no one here ever asks a follow-up question about what I'm doing or how they can do it locally, whereas stuff about climate is often followed up. So anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't expect this group to be any different. You're a great test case of who you are, and I enjoy being in the group. I'm trying to calm down after that, hands down. But uh, again, I know that, that threatens you, Jerry, and that's okay. I'm sorry it doesn't threaten me. I've asked you follow-up questions in the Zoom before when you've done several it, um, demonstrations it, it of the work really, you did. It happens exceptionally rare. So, you know, well, that's, that's not just... never. Okay. You made a declarative. It, nobody ever follows up. This group only cares about climate. Doug C. has been trying to make sure we only care about climate for a long time, and we talk about everything else. So I don't know. You're generalizing a lot, and I'm sorry that this brought up a lot of emotions for you. I wasn't trying to trigger you. I was just trying to say, hey, when you make the broad sweepy declarations, um, we do care. And, and, and I refer people to your work in Swannanoa. You don't hear about it. But, but like, I love the work you're doing. And I think you've got feet on the street that matter a lot. And you're doing a lot more actual stuff in the world than many of us are. So uh, all hail. I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm thrilled you're here. So I, uh, I, I want to hear uh, what Kevin said, um, whether or not it's 100% it's, uh, accurate. I, I, uh, I, I honor the, 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 um, uh, the, the the impression that uh, that he has, I, I think he's got a valid impression. We talk a lot about climate, and we don't talk a lot about economic fairness. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. Thanks, That's accurate. I appreciate that too. Yep. Um, Doug B. You're muted. 
I, I echo Pete's acknowledgement and, and, and ditto that. <laughs> um, and, but there was, there was something in your share, Kevin, where you, you talked about the contextualization of freedom in that particular bucket and the power of that as the seed for what, what's followed. And, and it's almost identical what was done around the opiate crisis with the word pain. And the pharmaceutical company took the word pain, turned it into a disease condition to be treated. And that was the foundation of their marketing of their painkiller with the underlying representation as an opioid that it wasn't addictive. But it was it, the whole thing pivoted around their marketing pain as something quote treatable. They invented that that graphic of one to ten on a scale of one to ten. What, where's your pain? They created that as part of their marketing campaign. Are you popular about that, Doug? Because yeah. that's an ancient graphic. I I believe I, they I'm they were the have had that around for a really long time. I think if I if I remember the tale, I mean the 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 rise of uh, what's the company that's behind um, uh, um, um, Purdue. 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 Yeah, right. Purdue. Purdue Pharma. That was like the one of the foundation pieces of their marketing campaign to doctors. Yeah. Now it may have pre-existed them, but they made it mass market in the medical field. Barbara Kingsolver's uh, Demon Copperhead is great about that with poor white folks in Kentucky and how it was marketed as as pain, and they said there was no risk. It's a really am amazing book. And and I, you know, I just pulling back from both of those examples. It makes me sort of wonder what is, what's the languaging shift? And this is sort of for the room, but what are the words and what are the recontextualization opportunities in connection with those words to potentially energize and pivot a change in orientation? that would speak to both economic justice, speak to our environmental challenges, all of that. Are there expressions, you know, and I think that they lie in fundamental nouns. <laughs> I think somewhere the truth lies in, in identification of na certain nouns. Um, and, and how might they be recontextualized to, to generate a new narrative? And with that, I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Can you say a little, a little more about reappropriation, reframing of nouns and stuff like that? Because I think that's one of the keys that's happening in the, in the verbal battle that is playing out in front of all of us. And I think you know, freedom is one of freedom and liberty are words that uh, certainly have been in the center of that of that battle in lots of interesting ways. Absolutely, and and. Um, a big part of the a big part of the um, undermining and propaganda programs of the la of the last several years um, have been about rendering terms that had meanings meaning less or or in newspeak ways uh, perverted to the opposite. <laughs> So, so literally, if if underlying all of those those gymnastics, those those linguistic conceptual gymnastics and distortions, um, words just really have power. And if words themselves are rendered value, meaningless, rendered valueless, um, it gets really difficult to counter what Stacy ran into. Because if you're up against a, a viscerally attached belief, 
rooted not in reality or facts or data or any of that, just rooted in belief, pure belief, like I bought something and this is my belief. You know, like that scene from Full Metal Jacket when the guy loses and he goes, this is my rifle. You know, it's like, this is my belief. <laughs> and at that point, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's any way in linguistically. But is there a means to energize <laughs> words and revitalize certain words in language to turn the tide on? You know, I don't know whether any of you saw the Nikki Haley thing. Yeah. Which where, where she, well, the most recent one where she twisted herself to avoid using the word slavery in response to the question, what was the reason, you know, what, what was the underlying reason for the Civil War? And wow. she gave an answer. And it, it was sort of like the university presidents yeah, trying to say parts. it was... Oh, it wasn't a violation of, you know, their, their, co it's, it was exactly the same moment. And all she had to do was say, well, slavery, of course. And instead she did 158 words without ever using the word slavery. <laughs> and the guy at the end said, it sort of amazes me in 2023, you answered that question and never used the word slavery. And she looked at him and said, well, what do you want me to say? Which is the story of her campaign. But at, at the end of the day, um, language intrinsically has huge power to be a tool or a weapon. And the, it seems to me there may be some attention and focused work collaboratively on words that could be contextualized and, and, and energized. Uh, could be a powerful orientation and approach to changing the changing the flow. Just quickly, the realtors in San Antonio say we cannot talk to our board about reparations, but we can use the word repair. And I'm finding that a lot of places. People can point to the current damage that's been caused, look at the rubble in Gaza and, and not do reparations. That reparations won't work. So, but repair will work, and you can point to a current thing that can that needs some amendment. And Kevin, I think years ago you were talking about a repair tax or a voluntary repair payment that people might pay as tourists. Yeah, and it's 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 complicated in Asheville. We, there is a reparations commission that's trying to extend itself to get the problem solved, and they've got too many old moderates on there, and. The, it's it's it, it's politically complicated uh we it, it exists and they they can't agree on anyway yeah it's 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 not simple thanks um kill Kevin, i'm going to quote you on it's not simple um i've had a number of people in discussions on um social media in particular about israel palestine who mm. say who say with exclamation points, it's not complicated. In other words, like, you know, what I say is right and don't give you any of the nuance. And mm. it, it's remarkable to me, to, to my experiences is like stunned uh, because it tells me more about them than about the issues. Because um, it strikes me that a lot of things are actually quite complex and understanding the nuances is really important to get at it. Uh, I'm struck by this, uh, by this, um, Doug, what you've been saying about language and the distinction between repair and reparations. Um, and um, um, let me back up. I, I've, I've been thinking about Lakoff uh, through this conversation, who's been talking about framing and the power of words and setting context with words for decades. And the, the Dems have been had a very hard time absorbing that for whatever reason, uh, seem to have not been able to master that. And when you talk about repair and re versus reparation, I think about the tendency on the left to really want to make sure you use the right word. It's like mm. you got to say reparation, not repair, um, without an understanding of what the political and social dynamics are. And you know, Kevin, I love what you said about doing things with people about the single issues that we care about together, uh, which is the way the coalitions grow. You, know, you start there, and then you find, oh, there's some other things we might care about together, or maybe it's different people. But you know, gradually, a fabric gets stitched together. Uh, and 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 um, 
Last, I'll just say, I, I was reminded of this yesterday in a conversation. Bernice Reagan, um, who you may know is the anchor of the Sweet Honey in the Rock a cappella group, but is also mm. a major, major scholar at the Smithsonian uh, for many years, um, spoke at a conference in California, gosh, must have been back in the 80s, where she said, memorably, she said, if you're in a coalition around whatever, if you're in a coalition, if you're not deeply uncomfortable all the time, mm. Your coalition is not big enough. Done. Thank you, um, Pete. Uh, I really like. Um, I I really appreciate. I really value the the story that Kevin told about the word or the idea of freedom and and Doug's uh, story of the word or the pain scale um, and the rest of it. Another one in the, uh, in the article that I linked, um, they were trying to make pain uh, a fifth vital sign. Um, uh, and, and actually I really like the, that post um, that I linked to because the guy says, this, this was actually a disservice to people to reduce a complex set of things that you're feeling down to a one to 10 scale. So the nurse says, Okay, what's your number? Is it four or five, six, ten, whatever? You know, and he's like, dude, you know, <laughs> I'd like to actually tell you about my lived experience more than <laughs> I want to be a number on a chart, you know. Um, I the and and Doug, I really appreciate talking about the language and the words, and and I wanted to reflect a little bit more that um, I I think a lot of times those those marketing things. Another one of my marketing unfavorites is. Uh, milk equals calcium. Um, drinking cow milk to get calcium actually is bad for you. It's not good for you. Um, but, you know, it, it, that drilled into our heads in the 40s or something like that. And, you know, now it's now it's truth, you know. Um, so I, I think the um, I, what I wanted to say is it's not just the word or the language. It's actually a simplification of a worldview, right? Right. Um, so I've got this complicated thing. My head hurts and, you know, it hurts this way. It hurts that way. It hurts when I do this. It doesn't hurt when I do that. And I want to describe that to the doctor. And, you know, and then I got a promise from uh, from pharma that, dude, all you need to do is, is pick a number and then the doctor can give you a pill and it's all better, right? And we'll call that the pain scale. We'll call that, you know, a non-addictive, you know, uh, medicine for you. Um, it will make you better. So a complicated situation got distilled down into a very simple thing, right? Same thing with, with you know, thinking about freedom, you know? Well, I, I want what I want. So I'm gonna, if I can call that freedom, that's great, you know? <laughs> um, and then you forget kind of the externalities of that worldview. Um, that it it changes, you know, it 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 simplified it. Somebody, some marketing person, made it super easy for you to believe a simple thing when the world is actually complicated, right? So I I think uh, Doug, I I really like your idea of, you know, engineering or reverse engineering ways to ways to help people understand things with language, and and a lot of it is. For better or for worse, I wish it was, weren't this way, but for, for better or for worse, it's help me, you know, I, I want to help you make the world a simpler, more easy to understand place. And, and here's a model rather than just here's, you know, here's a word that makes more sense to me or to you or, or should make more sense to you. It's actually a lot more complicated and it's about, you know, um, helping people cope with reality, um, which is which is hard. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, before going to Kevin, I just want to reflect for a second on the pain scale because I, I saw that thing. I've seen it a long time, but it was really helpful for me communicating with my mom and doctors communicating with my mom in her decline of the last five, the last five years of her life. And it just basically it just basically helps standardize. Like, is this pain immobilizing to you? Like you can't think or do anything else. That's number four or five or something like that, or maybe seven. Uh, but it but it sets a couple different barriers. And at no point did I see it used for guidance to pills, although I can see how that I can easily see how that would be done. Um, so I can see how it would be manipulated to like, oh, we have a pill for this that's just stronger than this one over here. You you you're a seven, not a six, so you need an opiate, not an aspirin. That's a very easy conversation to to come up with. Um, but I but a, I found that it, a, a a different 
a different way to do that rather than a number is uh, suggested in the, the article. What does your pain prevent you from doing? Which is Ooh. the question, which is the question that the scale is asking. Um, but often mm. people aren't, my, after my mom had a stroke, she wasn't verbal. So she couldn't actually answer that question, but she could point to a sheet of paper. Right. So, so if you're, if you're not verbal, you, get, you got some problems. Uh, Gil about the pain scale. Yeah. Kevin, if I could just jump in for a moment. Yeah, sure. So, you know, my wife, who's been in cancer treatment for 10 years, sees doctors regularly, and they always sort of the, the, the admitting nurse always asks the pain question. And it's pretty much always without any of the kind of context you're talking about. It's just like, what's the number? Or it's like, what's, you know, how are you now? Uh, it's not asking about how are you today? Or how have you been this week? Or how have you been since the last time you saw the doctor? Uh, so, and it's not with the context of four means this and seven means this, it's just asking for a number. Uh, and I've had that experience when I've seen doctors myself, and I'm often just kind of groping for, I don't, I don't know what the right number is. I sort of have a sense of range, but no precision. Um, and they're using that to track something uh, in an assumption that there's a statistical way to get insight into people's state. And it's part of this lust for standardization in industrial medicine and industrial everything, um, which, you know, understandable. I want a certain amount of standardization. I want to know that the screws are going to fit in the wings of the airplane uh, with some reliability wherever they have come from. Um, but we're really caught up in a mess between our hunger for recurrent, re predictable recurrence uh, and, um, and um, hunger is not the right word, and a something and a, and a, and a, and a, and a desire or a willingness for emergence and adaptation and things being, you know, different and appropriate to the moment. And it's hard to imagine how you do that at scale in an 8 billion person industrial society. Um, but it all um, lives in these one on one conversations between a doctor and a patient or a person in the neighbor, whatever else it is. Gil, until I saw the written out pain scale with descriptions of what the numbers were supposed to mean, I had the same exact reaction you were having, like one to 10, my scale is going to be real different from everyone else's. I'm just fishing. Uh, but once I saw the descriptions, I was like, oh, okay, this pain is irritating and in my conscience, but doesn't stop me from doing things. Great. That's this number right here. Totally. And that it, it really added to the precision of the, of the metric. Not just to the precision of the metric, but like that actually, that asking me that kind of question actually brings me self-awareness. Right. Who I am, where I am, what's going on in me. I have, I've seen the elaboration of the scale maybe one or two percent of the time that I've encountered the scale. It's 90% mm -hmm. of the time is just a number. Sometimes it's a number with a happy face. There's the, that's the other one. That's the hardly, happy face scale. Hardly ever with the narrative unpacking, which I agree with you is actually useful. But then you have to have a doctor or a nurse who's having a conversation with you. Right. Not a 10 minute in, insurance company mediated encountering. If, Kevin, if I could just say one more thing on this, because this was also yeah. very fresh on um, on um, how I built this on NPR this week. I came in, in the middle of a show and they were <coughs> talking about various Nobel Prize winning economists observations on certain things. And the one I walked in in the middle of was we have found that people are are really not um, people are not very capable of making decisions about what kind of medical plan to go on. Huh. People are very good at that. I thought, holy crap, man! How about like you're not very good at presenting people with either clear choices, or how about like no choice at all, just like comprehensive coverage, like you get in France or various other places in this planet. Uh, and and it was and it was it pathologized the mess that we were in, I mean, we just went through open enrollment about Medicare supplement plans, and it's an absolute pain in the ass nightmare. Needs We have a professional consultant who spends hours on this, paid for by them, God bless them. Uh, but it's, you know, create a mess and pathologize people for not being able to move through it. I remember years ago looking at one of these sort of drug selection, drug plans, and you had to choose a plan that assumed you knew what diseases you were going to get. The next because year. The because the different plans were good for chronic diseases or emergencies or whatever. And you were like, there is no way a human knows what their pattern is going to be. Unless yeah. you have a pre-existing condition, in which case you're in a different pot of trouble until yeah. Obamacare. Even not that. I mean, you know, Jane's got pre-existing conditions. She has, you know, she's in various kinds of chem chemical treatment for cancer. We have to choose a plan based on last year's medications. Mm. 
you know, next week the doctor may change the meds and that this and that decision is a tens of thousands of dollars difference. Right. And there's and there's no way to know. And you make your decision and you're locked in for 15 months or whatever it is. Very so. insane. Yeah, th Kevin, thanks, Gil. Kevin, thank you for your patience. And, yeah. and Gil, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing some yeah. of Jane's trouble. Thank you, Gil. She, she's been through a lot, um, a lot. Please, Kevin, go ahead. One other thing about pain before I go into what I was going to say is that uh, in King Solver's uh, book, they talk, it, it, Purdue goes in and sets up, pays doctors to set up pain clinics in a place where the industry has just vanished coal and they're doing uh, mountaintop removal, so no jobs. So people are depressed and injured and have no jobs. And so then they, they victimize them. On, on Israel, uh, I've been uh, really reading Mika Sifri's uh, uh, Substack. And I, I said, well, you know, this is a genocide that's going on. He says, no, it's not genocide. That's a specific thing where you want to eliminate the whole people. You can call it ethnic cleansing if it continues. So he said that that's what you can call Israel's policy if it continues as ethnic cleansing. So that's just one white guy reporting on what a knowledgeable Jewish guy is saying about it. So there you go. Thank you, Kevin. Um, why don't we pause for a second? That's a lot of stuff. Uh, Hank, nice to see you. Uh, Hank, Ken, Carl, anybody who hasn't jumped in for a bit, if you'd like to tell us what's on your mind or take us in a different direction, please feel free. Yeah, let me uh, change the direction or at least suggest a different direction based on what's on my mind. Uh, I began the year with uh, intense pain in both legs and had a uh, back operation to remove a stenosis uh, in February and have recovered nicely from that. Uh, so that at the moment, what's on my mind is uh, remembering how much pain I had a year ago and being very thankful for, let's call it uh, normal medical, medicinal track for helping me get over it. And that uh, was my, uh, my uh, reflection on the discussion of the the scale for pain because I was asked that uh, maybe a, a dozen or two dozen times uh, before uh, the operation, getting the diagnosis and after the operation. Uh, but what's on my mind now is uh, actually next year and what the opportunities are that uh, a brand new year might bring us. Uh, regardless of the many conflicts in the world going on, and uh, Israel-Palestine was just mentioned, but that's uh, just one of very many conflicts in the world where people are dying or being ethnically cleansed. Okay, that's all stuff that we have to figure out how to deal with uh, either, or let's say, both in our personal lives, where we may or may not have much influence, and considering that other people who can influence uh, things like that are not successful at the moment or haven't been brought into the conversation as yet. Uh and that's a bridge to an activity that I've been working on for the last, last year. And it's a conference which will finally be held uh, next February in Iceland about different futures of democracies. I think I've mentioned something about that in earlier calls, but there's a confirmation that we will have uh, visitors from participants from 15 different countries, including um, parliamentarians uh, who are 
engaged in parliamentary committees of the future. Finland has one of the most famous ones. Uh, last uh, two months ago, there was a conference in Uruguay, brought together uh, dozens of parliamentarians who either are parts of committees for the future or uh, investigating how to uh, how to create something like that. And uh, we'll have a delegation from Uruguay, a delegation from Nepal, also very interested in that. And we're assuming that there will be four or five other delegations uh, uh, signing up to participate. And what I, with my co uh, uh, organizers are hoping to do is to create three days where there are conditions for people to discuss amongst themselves in creative ways what are the values needed for renewing democracies, uh, what are the drivers of change, which could be obstacles or uh, or advantages in trying to uh, renew democracies in the future. We'll have uh, one day of presentations, building up uh, a number of uh, building blocks for people to take into a second day, which will be eight hours of uh, creative uh, uh, dialogue in laboratory sessions, one about climate change, one about technology, and one about governance paradigms. And the third day will focus very much on what people have learned in the first two days and will take away. And uh, I'm very interested in what people on this call and people in OGM think about the futures of democracies. Uh, it certainly relates very much to what uh, Kevin was talking about at the beginning of the call. But anyone on this call who has something to share about futures of democracy in a positive way, in a way uh, that we would hope people would get together around the world to uh, to support or to translate into their own culture and take forward. I'd be very happy to uh, either have conversations with them between now and February or look up any material that uh, they might suggest on the chat. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. And I, I love your explorations into democracy and world futures and, and all of that. Um, and it's funny because democracy is one of those words we use a lot, but don't seem to understand very well at all. Mm -hmm. And civics courses have gone out of fashion or got stamped out of school. So kids don't even usually understand how, you know, as they grow up, they don't usually understand the mechanisms that govern their lives in the future. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of sort of unwritten rules about democracy, unwritten taboos, like direct democracy is impossible, could never work. There's a, a, a bunch of other things like that. And I uh, I have a multiple, I was just sort of looking through the different collections of things I have around repairing democracy, defending democracy, rethinking democracy and all that, and making better connections between them. I'll send you a bunch of a bunch of links or I'll, I'll put them in the chat here. Um, Great. Th thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else who uh, yeah, wants to jump in, please get yeah. in the queue. Go, go ahead, Kevin. Okay, yeah, um, I was part of a group trying to get the first uh, openly gay Episcopal bishop elected. And um, we had a litmus test. I was the straight white guy on the thing, but I was the underground reporter, undercover reporter, so I was okay. And uh, we had a litmus test. And so the, the Urban Caucus, which is the black Episcopalians weren't allowed in because they were not aligned with the progressives on abortion and they couldn't be in the room with them. Whereas the Christian right were single issue uh, partnerships. So there was a group and I was uh, undercover and uh, in a room where the folks who hated women uh, bishops and women priests 
we're doing a deal with the folks who hated LGBT and the other folks hated LGBT too. And they said, look, we have nine points. We are agreeing on three, six, and eight. We can do an alliance and forget about the other stuff. But the leftists couldn't agree about the other. And that's also true of freedom of choice and right to life. And so that's why Barbasi's book, Link, points to the fact that uh, right to life groups grew uh, uh, geometrically. You know, and uh, but the, the links to the freedom of choice folks only grew arithmetically because you needed to sign on to a litmus test. So I'd say in democracy, find the single issue like for us, the new urbanists don't care about economic justice. They care about fair taxation. We're doing the same thing with folks who care about uh, a partnership with folks who want to invest in local businesses who don't care about justice. But there is no forum for folks who just care about investing in local businesses. So we're single issue partnerships and they don't have to agree with us on all the other things. And that, you know, that's that's working. Thank you. The, yeah. Those politics, uh, the, how the sausage is made politically is fascinating and scary often. Um, Doug B. Uh, you're muted. It's sort of uh, turning the telescope around, Hank, on where you're going. But one of the questions that rises for me is, um, and I know there's lots of, there's a large body of work as to the, um, the pattern and the, the, the emergence of, of fascism if that's the sort of polar tension to democracy. And we're sort of in the middle of experiencing that. I just wonder whether on a, on a living, uh, experiential, emotional, energetic basis, um, there's a root underlying those attracted, attracted to fascism who experience it as pull, whether there's an underlying root on a fundamental basis that might be susceptible or vulnerable to opening and to softening that um, is more sort of more existentially fundamental in, in a humanist way than uh, the political, you know, um, focusing on the political or responding to the political. And I just wonder whether there's something more vital as a, as a potential opening or vulnerability to that mindset Stacy ran into. Um, and whether, whether um, affecting that, that attraction that fascism seems to exert on certain people um, might also be an angle of attack complementing getting back to democracy, you know, freeing people up to, um, you know, if, if they don't get drawn to that, they're, they're going to drift in the other direction. The other direction is democracy. So it's sort of like freeing them up to float toward your neck of the woods. Just Thanks. curious. Thanks, Doug. Stacey, you had your hand up earlier. Did you take it down or did it go down by mistake? No, Zoom took it down, but right now they're like blow. Uh, can you hear this background noise here? Nope. Okay, so we hear, we hear you, we hear you clearly. Go right ahead. It's hard, it's hard for me to think and I can't hear you, but maybe I can speak. Um, so as related to um, concerns about democracy, and this might not sound so connected, but it is. So one of the questions that's been coming up for me has to do with the genocide in Sudan and why that doesn't make it into the narrative, which brings me to the role of the media. And that's really my biggest concern. So I just wanted to put that out there. And also, if anybody can give me some insight into the role of the Arab nations in that whole thing, that's a piece that I feel if more information got out, Doug, to what you're talking about, there's something in that information that I think could connect. 
yeah, I, I, I can't articulate what I'm trying to say, but there is something in what you just said, Doug. And there is an inroad, not to all the people there, but to some of the people, and that's the key, finding the people in the different groups that you can relate to. That's what I was trying to do in the experience that I spoke about. And with one of those people, I was able to do that. In the other person who clearly, no matter what, that's not the person I wanna deal with. But by dealing with the other one, there's ripple effects. Thank you. Um, are you complete? I am. I'm sorry. I don't have better words for that. And oh, that's, I was that's also right. frazzled by the outside noise. Thank you. It worked out fine. Um, Pete, please. Thank you, Stacey. Um, I, I really like I don't have better words for that. That that's, <laughs> seems like a headline for our times. <laughs> um, Hank, uh, thank you for working on democracy and um, uh, and I wouldn't say this to somebody who's not a friend, but <laughs> um, I have a bit of skepticism about democracy, which maybe I can kind of put aside, but, but it makes me think um, also um, that a, a, a topic for me and maybe for this group is what's the role of democracy in, in an age of preparing for collapse? Um, and I think, you know, if there's collapse, um, I pray that there won't be, um, but if there is collapse, um, democracy is probably not the, the best way to, the best stance, you know, and, and post-collapse. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of fraught things there, you know, like, why would you prepare for a disaster when, you know, that the disaster would mean the end of ev everything, but but I guess if I were um, at a, at a comp conference about democracy, I would be really interested in what's the role of democracy in preparing for collapse. Thanks. Let, let me just uh, mention that, uh, uh, well, I, I absolutely agree with you, Pete, and I'm also unfortunately very skeptical about the powers of democracy in the face of collapse and that something else which we don't know yet uh, will be used or could be used or should be used uh, to deal with it. Uh, one of the things that uh, we really want to do with this conference is uh, look to the positive uh, rather than look at up the obstacles and the and the negative things, because there's so much in the media, at least in in European media, about all the negative things uh, driving democracy down a dead end street. So one of the premises of the conference is to bring together people to specifically focus on the futures of democracies that they would want and how they in their cities or or countries or parliaments uh are, would be ready to deal with it uh, that doesn't take away that i'm often very skeptical about uh, uh renewing democracy with the uh, with the uh, cello tape and paper clips and the other things that are being offered at the moment I'm reminded of, of uh, Doug C. Um, um, in, in conversation with him recently, uh, he was saying that it seems like the challenge of climate um, and carbon and all the other things that are going on uh, is outside the limits of uh, a nation state. Um, it's you know, transcendent above that. The problem is you, you can't fix it if you're one nation state, you, you know, um, and he called it civilization level. So I, I guess a, another, another question I would kind of have is how can a democracy participate in a civilization and maybe with, you know, other, other nation states who don't really care to have democracy um, in the service of 
um, uh, saving civilization. Um, so I, it's a, you know, a, 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 not only do I need my democracy to fix my nation, I need my democracy to fix, not fix, uh, to participate in, in a civilization that's going to survive, um, you know, uh, most equitably and most um, least, least damagingly into the future. Thanks, Pete. Uh, I, I love this topic of democracy, et cetera. So I want to put a couple ideas uh, in the room. Um, I've said a couple of places where um, I, I see a difference between big G governance and little big G government. I miss, I even mistyped that in my notes. It should be big G, big G government versus little G governance. And big G government has mostly become a consumer mass marketing exercise of politics. Uh, it isn't really governance in, in, a, in a highly functional way. We are trapped inside of a variety of assumptions and systems. Um, uh, if you look in my brain under variants of anarchism, anarchism was very effectively demonized. And years ago, I've told this story several times, I went to read some book chin because I wanted to read one of the anarchists and see how terrible it was. And the first half of the book is all about collaboration among animals in nature. And it, really, most of the anarchists are trying to figure out how do we manage one another together in a way that has the least overhead. It's something a libertarian ought to love, but hey, we managed to demonize anarchism completely. So some people are anarcho-capitalists anarcho these days, which is an attempt to cut that edge and find a path. There's anarcho-syndicalism. There's, there's flavors of anarchism I couldn't describe to you at all, but, but there's lots of them, just as there are many flavors of capitalism and many flavors of democracy. I have all those variants sort of in, you know, in my brain with who came up with the idea, what the book did they write, whatever, whatever. But but to me, that exploration is really interesting. One of the reasons Dawn of Everything is so fascinating is that it's an attempt, a kind of a messy attempt, I think, to go back and explore the various ways we tried to govern one another and, and collaborate to form society. And famously, Thatcher saying there is no such thing as society was the like this ultimate sort of, far, this ultimate Reaganist uh I'm, and I, I'm going to lose the framing for it because I'm probably not accurate on it. But it's it's really interesting how that all worked out. Um, I'm really interested in a global movement to pretend to create a fake global government as as a game because it, it, it's easier to take games less seriously so they don't get inter interdicted or intercepted as much. But what if we pretended to govern together along watershed lines as our as our boundaries? And what if we then? came up with a, a variety of the, the high, most highly functional kind of ways of doing things following uh, Ostrom's polycentric governance principles and other sorts of principles. Um, what would that look like? And might it get interesting and big enough that it could, in fact, um, do that? So um, anyway, uh, and and such a such a fictitious, wishful thinking governance system would include actual sense-making, exploration, experimentation. You know, we talk about uh, whether it's refugees at the border or uh, drug use and uh, drug deaths or homelessness in cities or whatever. There's plenty of, of Earth to, that, that has already experimented with a lot of these things. We should be learning from them. Uh, Portland right now is facing a huge crisis with, you know, fentanyl and meth and all that. They tried to copy Portugal, which decriminalized drugs uh, back some years ago successfully until they stopped funding the support systems for it. And then that thing started falling apart. So now that the paradigmatic example got worse. Um, and yet when Portland passed the law just in the last election cycle, they didn't put in any of the other support systems. And Portland has like really lousy stats on, on mental health support and all that other kind of stuff, crappy stats. And, and then now they're scratching their heads wondering why it failed. So I've been listening in on a couple of Zoom calls from authorities that, you know, in the area trying to sort this out. And it's just, it seems really obvious that they could see the problem. They didn't do much about the problem and nobody really fixed it. So it's weird. Uh, thank you for tolerating my little screed there. Uh, oh, Schrader's been writing about that a lot in both sci-fi and as a futurist. Oh, uh, which one, Carl Schrader? Carl Schrader, yeah, Carl with a K. Schroeder, but he says Schroeder. Pronounce the Schroeder. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Gil, please. Catching my breath after your rant, Jerry. Ah, uh, thanks. It's a most excellent rant. I think you've got your next project laid out for you. Oh, good. So go, go you know, shadow global, shadow global government. Go do that. Um, right behind you. Um, 
I like the topic of democracy. I, I look forward to us talking more about that. And I look forward to us talking more about anarchism because you're, 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 I, I think you're right in how you characterize it um, and what's, what's been hidden there. Um, Bookchin has been one of the, one of the formative people in my life and his work is deep and very rich and full of love. Um, and um, if people are not aware, uh, look up the, the Rojava communities in uh, Kurdish Turkey. Um, where uh, where there's a remarkable expression of that work. I don't know if any of those folks are alive anymore after all the bombs that have been dropped recently. Um, um, Democracy is really messy. It's really hard. Uh, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, if anybody has been to meetings, you know, council meetings, community meetings, uh, co-op meetings, whatever, it's it's rough stuff to do. Um, uh, you know, Doug C has. Are you still? Yeah, you are still here. Has talked a bunch about the need for autocratic responses to things like the climate crisis. But of course, the question is, who's the autocrat? Um, you know, is it our guy or their guy or somebody we like or don't or somebody who's wise or not? Um, I keep going back on one of the one of the challenges for me with autocracy versus democracy is is Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety, uh, which is that an autocracy just doesn't doesn't move enough information. Um, through the system uh, to enable wise decisions. And we see that, you know, we see that in the Israel debacle where the Israeli political establishment didn't get, uh, wasn't able to interpret the information it was gathering to prepare itself for what was coming. Um, um, I did a, um, I did an inquiry on Facebook in the last couple of days asking people for examples of where human society has collectively decided to ban innovative technology. And I thought the examples, I thought it was a very short list. And it turns out it's a very large list. I mean, we, we, you know, we actually know how to do this. We actually know how to come together as society, despite what Mar Maggie Thatcher says, and make decisions that affect our coll collective evolution, but you know, not all the time. Um, and, um, you know, and there you there there is you know big global scale Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances is you know like a sterling example of that. Um, mm -hmm. It took a while and has been successful to a large degree. Um, for people to say democracy doesn't work, I think you know as one example of uh, work of my friend Chauncey Bell, who has been working with large industrial companies, never under the guise of democracy, but for example with. Um, with folks who are building multi-billion dollar semiconductor fab factories uh, uh, and um, bringing the executive leadership to the willingness to turn over the work to the trades, you know, to the, to the, to the craftspeople and workers and put more control in the hands of the people on the ground. Uh, and guess what? This is not a waste of time. This produces, you know, uh, you know, factories that are built ahead of schedule and under budget. So the notion of democracy being messy is maybe another opioid scale that we've been taught. And actually where I started this, my, my rant in response to your rant about the difficulty of democracy is that we are talking now about democracy in a world of media consolidation, citizens united, uh, the, you know, the disappearance of the fairness doctrine, and a whole set of conditions that have really shifted the landscape of democracy, at least in this country. I don't know how it is in Europe or other places. Uh, but the the game is has been gamed for decades, uh, and that's you know so we're playing inside of that game. And part of the question is how do we invent new games? Um, and you know I I I find that when I talk about games a lot, I, I often get the response of wait this is this is serious. This is not a game. But game just means a set of rules that people agree on about how to do something, and games get invented all the time. Um, and um, maybe that's a place for us to think about also in the future. You know, thank you. Thanks, Gil. Um, before I go to Pete, or real quick, you touched something that keeps coming up in conversations I have, and I, I just don't like it. So I gave it, I think, better, I gave it better phrasing in the chat <clears throat> than I usually do, which is there's a common false dichotomy that it's either free markets or absolute centralization. God, everybody knows what happened to the Soviet Union in China, and that's just terrible. And that's just a completely broken argument. Yeah. Because the only, it isn't that isn't the spectrum, and we don't have a free market, and the only alternative isn't that. 
But I think the really interesting question is, what are some fabulous ways to, to make sure resources get around? I mean, we've all heard the truism that there's enough food to feed everybody on the planet. It just doesn't make its way around. It's economics. It's everything else. The, the, the Great Bengal famine was an economic famine. And there's a thought in my brain that most famines are economic. Uh, the British had plenty of grain. Indians had no money to buy grain with, and the British wouldn't release their supplies. So millions of people starved to death in Bengal. Yep, and on the free market piece, Elizabeth Warren's been terrifically eloquent about the folks who say free markets. I built this company, and she points out, you know, the massive amount of social subsidy. Yep, you know, ranging from roads to educational systems that support every individual entrepreneur action. So it's never just one or the other. Thank you for that, Chair. Yeah, love that, uh, Pete. Please. Um, I th I think I have a question for Hank um, about democracy, but but let me let me preface it kind of i i realized i was i was thinking about it um and my skepticism around democracy um and um uh i also like the the i don't know if i like it i i know of the churchill quote uh, democracy is the worst form of government except everything else has been tried and i i hear mr churchill um uh saying that in my head and i go okay well i guess we have to fix democracy <laughs> Um, I think we need to come up with something better, but, but, uh, um, and, and for me, it's network decentralization somehow, but, um, but anyway, I realized my uncomfortable with uncomfortableness with democracy. Um, and by the way, um, for anybody listening, I'm not trying to overthrow any governments or anything like that. I appreciate, um, the, the government within sort, which of, I sort of sad about that, Pete, um, I, I say what I say, you know? Um, uh, so I have two models for democracy and neither one of them is, well, I mean, one of them, one of them worked, uh, you know, for a hundred years or something like that. So there's the democracy that the U.S. was founded upon. Um, uh, rich white landowners in, kind of in an old boys network making decisions about, you know, uh, their concerns, you know, that's democracy. Everybody's got to vote except the people who don't count as people. We're all good. Um, everybody was educated, uh, everybody had kind of the same concerns. And so, you know, that kind of democracy, and that was the democracy that I was sold in school. You know, this is, this is how we govern our country. Everybody has a vote, <laughs> you know, uh, everybody's educated, uh, everybody thinks this, you know, more or less the same when we have some little quibbles about the uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and, you know, and, and the, the, the greater statesmen among us, statesmen, uh, among us, uh, you know, we'll have a good idea and then we'll all, you know, debate the idea and then, you know, agree to follow, you know, Mr. Lincoln or Mr. Washington or Mr. Jefferson or whoever, right? So that's, you know, that's the model of democracy that I grew up with. And I probably, you know, thought that's what how the world ran for the first 40 years of my life or something like that. And then at some point, my, you know, I kind of started learning how the world works. And um, that, you know, the U.S. democracy for, for in my, my understanding of it, it got, got taken over by corporatism in the 1800s. Uh, corporations figured out how to game the system and become persons themselves. Um, and corporation persons are even more person-ish person -ish than uh, uh, rich white males. So, oh my God, you know. Uh, so uh, 1900s was the age of um, big corporations and robber barons uh, pretending to be um, uh, nice people and um, and sometimes kind of being nice people uh, to the, the the poor you know, poor masses um, and then um, uh, the military industrial complex etc cetera, etc cetera, right so and that's the world that that's the democracy that I feel like I live in now um, it's a plutocracy, uh, you know, of, of people who figured out how to game the power. Um, and so, so <laughs> here's my question, Hank. Um, sitting where you are in Europe and uh, contemplating your, um, your conference in Iceland, I, I think <clears throat> you're talking about a different kind of democracy, a different model of democracy than, than I have in my, in my quiver of what a democracy is, right? Um, I, th I think you have uh, some, I, I so I imagine you have some Nordic sensibility, which um, I think a lot of uh, people in, in the US would call socialism, you know, oh, they're socialist crazy, you know, people they are not actually, you know, 
real de Democrats like we are, you know, what they're not plutocrats. So what's when you when you're contemplating democracy, what <laughs> like so I I literally and this is a weird thing to, you know, to admit um, to, you know, people I care about and and uh, being, you know, 60 plus years old. I like just mechanically it cannot work because in in a I, I is is my understanding of it because in a in a population such as the U.S. that's very diverse, um, where most people aren't educated or most people are indoctrinated um, into certain ideologies by um, by partially the education system, partly the media, partly the and mostly by the plutocrats, I, you know like. Like if you give every person in the U.S. a vote um, and bless us for doing that, you get chaos. You get people like not making good decisions. You get people who don't decide to vote. And so then the people who do vote are manipulated into, um, you know, uh, um, blessing the, the, the plutocrat of their, you know, of their tribe. <laughs> and, you know, that's I mean, you can call it democracy, but it's not um, so literally are there places in the world where you would say there's democracy that actually you know works and makes sense sorry to put that all on you hank but yeah no <laughs> but it's it's a, it's a stepping stone to a broader conversation of course uh the premise of the conference uh of the working conference is Nordic democracy, and there are five Nordic countries, and all of them have a sort of similar view of what democracy is or should be. Uh, it's the rule of law, it's uh, uh, high trust, uh, low control, uh, uh, it's voting for every resident, not just every citizen. There, there are a couple of other things I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the chat. And those five Nordic countries, and I'm taking part as a sort of honorary uh, Nordic European because I'm an American by origin and have lived almost 50 years in the Netherlands. Uh, so we see that in each one of those Nordic, five Nordic countries and the Netherlands and other reasonably progressive countries in Europe, uh, democracy is very quickly being eroded by a number of the things that you were just talking about, Pete. Uh, education, uh, ability to, to think independently, uh, uh, fear of the future, which helps people uh, uh, submit to someone who has a loud voice and, and rides a white horse and waves a big stick. Uh, I think at the moment of the countries that I'm rather familiar with, I would say that Finland and Denmark have a lot of things that could be translated to the future. I mean, they're all under threat at the moment. Finland also has a coalition government with a party of true Finns who would never say they're anti-democratic, but would probably uh, uh, quote uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary and say we're Ill illiberal democracies. But those two countries and maybe some things that are going on in uh, Norway and Iceland and Sweden and the Netherlands and and why not India, which is uh, using the word democracy in quotation marks is the biggest democracy in the world, and things there are values that people Hola. have. There are values that people have which aren't necessarily reflected by the governments that are in power now. And uh, to try to make a short answer to your question, uh, yes, if we're going to try to invent something new, yeah. there are building blocks which well, we could use, uh, which have been re reasonably successful in the 75 or so years since the Second World War. 
I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but it, I I appreciate the answer, and I'll have to think about it some more. I the if if I if I think of Finland or Denmark, um, I think of fairly uniform uh, populations, um, and that it seems like it kind of goes and and I, you know progressive and things like that. So um, um, I I you know unlike. Uh, unlike uh, the U.S. in the 1700s, you know, I, I also know that Finland and Denmark think that that women are people too. For instance, you know, oh my God, what a concept! Um, but but it still seem they seem fairly homogenous to me. And I th I think you know when you get a, a lot of dishomogeneity, uh, heterogeneity um, of education levels and living conditions and cultures and stuff like that it starts to seem to me that democracy is a really hard ask. Um, and, you know, and, and so in, in my perfect world, which I, I know is never going to happen and I'm okay with that, but in my perfect world, um, you get much, much smaller um, groups, self-governing groups, very small, small self-governing groups, you know, 30, 50 people, something like that. And those, federate with other small groups like that kind of fractally uh, up until you get until you get bigger it's just really hard i i think i i've 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 got this gut feel that democracy is and you know i'm i'm fine i i know that we're kind of revolving out around the a current definition of the word democracy which yeah. you know um, i would be perfectly happy to continue using the word democracy if we redefined it again to mean something different um, so I don't care about the word. I care about the ideas. The but the idea of a massively uh, heterogeneous uh, civilization um, running through a, a small pipeline called democracy, where everybody votes on everything, you know, it just it it seems impractical, right? So I guess I guess I'm I, what I'm thinking of is something more like distributed democracy or you know um, or hyper federalization or I don't know hyper federation or something, um, but it, you know it, it seems like we I feel sitting in the U.S. Um, that we got stuck on this democracy and we're very proud of it in the U.S. Um, we got stuck on it uh as a solution to you know a frontier country in the 17 late 1700s you know and then and then uh we've abused the heck out of the the core tenets and principles we've kept the letter of the the you know the rules we've kept the rules of the game the same um while the world has changed around us so um continuing to call that you know um the, the democracy of uh, Washington it seems crazy to me and, and thinking and and so even using the word democracy we're going to change democracy it, for me sitting you know in San Diego in 2023 it it brings so much baggage in that is just you know kind of kind of really friction um, anyway thanks and I'm I'm sorry. I I uh, love that you're <laughs> doing a conference in democracy uh, in 2024 in Iceland. So I'm not I'm not trying to poo-poo that. Um, more power to you. Yeah. Just as a very quick answer to Pete before uh, Doug and Carl, uh, if you ask me right now what the world uh, can use to to have equity and and uh, and rule of law and and uh, equal rights and responsibilities for everyone i couldn't answer the question but i do think that you can't go from the damaged democracies of now to something completely new without stepping stones so this whole idea of renewing democracies, and we try to use it as pl in the plural as much as we can, is more about figuring out stepping stones. So, well, I've got this map uh, in front of, behind me as I'm talking, you know, and we don't know exactly where we are and we don't know exactly where we're going, but we're definitely going because we're not in command. Uh, so this, I think the stepping stones in the next decade uh, will be very important. Um, I'm inspired to have a future OGM call 
be about democracy or governance at scale and um, would love to have us bring our better game to it so that we're a little more organized about it and step through. Uh, yes, no? Sounds good? Sounds good. Okay, with, um, at soon, like two calls from now, if we do next call check-in and then call after that democracy, that gives us a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Let's, let's do that. Um, oh, good. And Mike just joined us. So how appropriate. Uh, also, uh, we number yeah. among our friends, a lot of people who are experts in democracy, like Jake Donegan, uh, John Atley, a bunch of others who have a very, very deep knowledge about this and have been kicking this around for a while. It might be interesting to invite them to the call. I will, I will, I will invite the ones yeah. I know uh, in to see if they want to join us. Uh, Doug B, then Carl, then we're... Uh, Jerry we're Carnegie has a whole team working on democracy and conflict and um would could, do you mind either connecting me to them or inviting them to the call once i put the invite out yeah i'll, I'll see uh rachel kleinfeld would be the most amazing person to get let me see what i can do to link her to you thank you very much mike great idea um doug then carl then to ken i'm hoping yeah hank i i i can't help but feel that um you know, without the law of Jante, you wouldn't have the Nordic democracies. Like the underpinning cultural foundation of that um, enables the other. I will ask you to explain Jante Loven to everybody so that we can catch um, up with you. Well, it's, um, there are sort of, uh, Actually, I'm going to share my screen to make it a little bit easier because yeah, this it's have come up before. It, it's it's a fair it, it's a lot, but it's basically there are a set of rules, sort of tacit social rules. Um, do not think you're anything special. Do not think you're as good as we are. Do not think you're you are smarter than we are. Do not. Um, imagine yourself better than we are. Do not think you know more than we do. Um, you sort of get the drift, but it's um, it, it's an internalized socialization with sort of a fundament of underlying um, equality. Um, on uh, not equality on a in a in a political sense, but um, equality on a whole being basis. Yeah. If really if, quickly, the the realtors in Fresno thought King was a threat to bring that kind of equality there, and that's why they redefined freedom as freedom for the individual rather than the collective, and that became right wing doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> so, go ahead. So, so my my point is that it's it's culturally imprinted to be oriented toward the collective and to not and to do the opposite actually that it's it's you are part of you're one of you're no better than no worse than no more entitled no less entitled it's sort of why you have that striking homogenization of clothing like everybody looks the same because to do something loud and garish you would see in in america um would violate that it would sort of be like why are you standing out um what makes you special so there's literally a cultural judgment and you know approbation in relation to um not being part of and in service to the whole and and that certainly doesn't exist in the United States. <laughs> and Scott is pointing out in the chat that few of us have any experience of being un, under any other kind of system, whether it worked or, or works or not. So I appreciate that as well. Um, Carl, then Michael, then Ken. So bring up more of my ideas in um, a couple of weeks, but I mean, our our framers were dealing with trying to come up with an alternative to the divine right of kings. 
important thing to them was trying to establish a system of government that was stable, that you could have peaceful transfer of power. So what happened January 6, 2021 is the <laughs> biggest anathema to everything our framers stood, stood for um, and stuff. I mean, you can't, I mean, I see people criticizing with the modernism and stuff. It's like everybody used the word he until the women's movement of the late 60s and stuff. So don't get on, I mean, to criticize them because there's no she in the Constitution. I mean, give me a break. I get to go off for that. But I guess for 2024, we have the um, um, International Society for the System Sciences, and we'll be having our conference in June. That's really what I'm trying to focus on. Um, and well, I have this whole idea that I've talked a lot with Doug B about with Sunrise in Washington, but there's um, just, just um, we've got a, lots of ideas. I'm gonna kinda, I'm thinking them in terms of scenarios for events that would be happening in July. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm headed. And I got a lot of things to share with you, Hank. I'll have to do that. At a later time. Um, thanks, Carl. Uh, Michael. Hey, um, I apologize for having uh, missed the beginning of the call, but um, it's funny, I was listening to a conversation that was, that proves relevant about, about, um, unionization and collectivization and co-ops and um, really made me think as Jerry, you were talking about alternative world governance. Um, it seems to me that one key and one, one doable thing is for interest groups whether they're demographic groups, you know, whether it's and anything from, uh, well, the ARP does not cross borders particularly, um, but you know, there are there are er entities and organizations like Amnesty Inter International, like Doctors Without Borders, but you know, why not uh, older citizens on the ARP model? older citizens without borders, um, youth without borders, mothers without borders, artists without borders. And, and you know, the more collectivization and, and kind of membership organizations that exist trying to espouse the interests of that group across national borders and, and essentially unionizing to push ideas that that benefit their constituents, I th think the more effect can be had on governments in an extra governmental way. Um, so I, I'm, re I'm really curious to know about um, any movement successes like that that have existed um, and, and how we might, you know, how we might make ourselves union members of all the unions that we belong to um and and advocate in ways that you know go across watersheds I, I worry i worry a little bit about you know nested networked democracies um just because the special interests of people in one locality don't take into account the pan regional interests of groups that exist within all watersheds. Um, anyway, I'll leave it there. But thank you. Throw that out. 
Thanks, Michael. And I think we have like lots of lots of chewy stuff to come back to when we revive this topic and, and dive into it more. Uh, Carl, I was just curious. Uh, I'm going to share screen for a second. Uh, you you made a, a fun statement there that made me do something that I'm going to share with the share screen with. So the, the U.S. Constitution is modeled in some measure on the great law of peace of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the great six nations in the U.S. It had a tremendous effect on it. Uh, so I asked ChatGPT, hey, does the great law of peace mention women? And the answer is, and I hope it's not hallucinating and I'll have to fact check this later, but GPT-4 says the great law of peace, also known as the Gaia Nashagowa, is the founding constitution of the Iroquois Confederacy, a group of Native American tribes in North America. Uh, the constitution is significant, including its influence on the formation of the U.S. Constitution. It does indeed mention women and, in fact, gives them significant power and responsibility. Women, particularly clan mothers, played a crucial role in the Iroquois Confederacy, blah, 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 blah. Um, I will copy paste this into our, uh, our, our uh, OGM list. Um, but I, I think that the founding fathers were a particular set of people building a particular document that we deify a lot at, at great risk. Uh, it's a great document. It's really interesting, but boy, is it flawed. Um, and we haven't made changes to it recently. We're, the the constitution is very static. We have originalists who are in charge of the court. Uh, we're we're basically fucked because of the way the constitution is being used uh, and weaponized at this point. Um, I'm really curious about the Colorado disqualification decision and how it plays in the Supreme Court because, on purpose, I think the Colorado justices played an originalist card. Uh, in their decision. They, they said, hey, look here, look here, look here, and look at, uh, they, they actually quote um, Gorsuch from a prior court, uh, from when he was in a lower court, they quote him in the decision. And and it, for, for SCOTUS to, over, to overturn Colorado, Colorado it's going to be a big deal, I think. Uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm interested in how this plays out. But but the Haudenosaunee, like there were matrilineal tribes all across the, the, the North American continent um, before <laughs> Europeans showed up. Yeah, there's a long time conversation, as I said. We can, um, but so I guess um, Gills. Huh? Yeah, the Haudenosaunee used gender roles as a kind of checks and balances system. Maybe that's one of the things the founders learned from. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd say the Constitution is flawed, Jerry. It's what it was at the time. It was a brilliant innovation for its time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not all the things that we want now. Um, it actually, part of its brilliance is that it did provide for amendment. And we've had dozens of amendments since, which is a kind of adaptation as things go forward. Um, and part of the brilliance, which is really troubling and painful to us now, is that the amendment process isn't easy. And it had to be not easy because you ever, you ever drive a car without shock absorbers? So that damping function of a slow amendment process is necessary, but how slow and what it takes is a big problem. Uh, we, you know, we've tried for what fifty years to get an equal rights amendment, and we don't have one. Um, on the other hand, you know, the call for a constitutional convention, which some are doing, actually mostly on the right, and we are, we are not far from the trigger point on that. Uh, could be a wholesale mess of scrapping everything and starting from scratch in the current environment where money rules. So. Um, Given all those flaws, I kind of I, I I'm a semi I'm a semi originalist, I guess. Um, intriguing, intriguing. I, I want to keep this document for now till we find a better pathway to something else because I think the protections in it are are far more the protections in it far outweigh its flaws at this point. And we shall have uh, in two weeks uh, abundant more time, or at least ninety minutes more time to to talk about these issues. So, awesome. uh, and and now do we get a poem? I hope we do, Ken. We do. Hot damn. Kevin just, Kevin just put something by Wendell Berry in the chat, so uh, I will turn to Wendell Berry. So Wendell. This is Practice Resurrection. Oh, Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay. Want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So, friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord. Love the world. Work for nothing. 
Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Raise ignorance. For what man has not encountered what he has not yet destroyed? Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of hummus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful that you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie down in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest in your thoughts. And as soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the movements of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail. The way you didn't go, be like a fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. That's beautiful. Ken, thank Good you. Way to end the year. Exactly. Gil, thank you for posting a link to the poem in the chat. Um, and I would say if any anybody who's not familiar with Wendell Berry, uh, it's a very worthwhile deep dive. Go wander. Thank you, Ken. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for a spicy, intriguing, and fun end of your call. Yeah. Um, check in next week, and then after that, democracy or governance or something like that. Um, pardon. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And thanks, everyone, for feeding my thinking about uh, democracy. Happy uh, New Year. And thanks, everyone, we, for feeding our mutual thinking. On the OGM list, we have used the line, democracy next, or something, for to put our thoughts about democracy ahead of time. Mm, um, if you want to do that as a subject line, uh, that would be Yeah, fine. that's what we, I mean, as a subject line, yeah. And if you're on the Mattermost channel, the OGM Town Square, that's a good place as well. Yeah, I have that... a hard time with Mattermost. Okay, uh, feel free to use the OGM list then. But that's a that's a great idea. Democracy next, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Keep, keeping in mind that Hans is our, Hank is our real audience. <laughs> yep. <laughs> With with a couple of million or hundred million other people, I hope. Yeah, you're the gateway. You're the gateway to millions. <laughs> He's the key master. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you're the gateway to multitudes. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Happy, Happy New Year. Really, really appreciate Happy it. Happy New Year. Happy New, New Year. Year. Go join all your unions. That's right. Join and form all your unions. Mike, I want to hear about what you've been up to with that. Whoops, he's gone. Oh, you're not gone. Union Unions and co-ops, let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, would, I would love to. You guys. All right. Okay. Yeah.